Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited that you get to speak with this amazing priest, Father Richard McNeely. He is the vocation director for the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and a friend of mine and vocation ministry. So thank you so much for joining us, Father. It's always my pleasure, Rhonda. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, so um, we want to know about you. Tell us all uh, about how you grew up and anything that was really striking that helped you to discern your vocation. Sure. I'm going to give you like the five minutes or version because <laughs> there, like it's been a while talking about especially the vocational discernment. That actually took me like five years. Um, I think that's too long, by the way, but <laughs> but it took me a while, so. Um, I am, my name is Father Richard McNeely. I'm the vocation director here in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. And I've been a priest now for almost six years. It'll be six years in June. And um, it's been it's been great. I really enjoyed it. I went to seminary for uh, seven years because I had already gone to college. I even went to grad school. I studied a lot of philosophy and I had kind of an underground background in finance. And so actually went to grad school for like applied ethics or business ethics. Um, and somewhere in college, I had a pretty significant conversion. I had always kind of grown up, I guess you could call me like a cradle Catholic, but uh, you know, I was part of a family that went to mass on Sundays. I went to Catholic schools, uh, but I don't know that I ever really took my faith seriously. And um, you know, my parents probably pushed me more in terms of like, be a lawyer, be a doctor, have a stable life and a career. Uh, and then you can, you know, go to mass on Sundays and things like that. So it's not like they uh, pushed me away from my vocation, but they definitely kind of steered me uh, to some practical realities. And so in college, I had a pretty strong experience of God's love on Good Friday of all. I mean, it's the best day, right, to receive God's love. Somebody was reading the diary of St. Faustina. It was our new pastor. He was reading it for the Stations of the Cross. And that just spoke to me in a way that nothing ever had. And Jesus spoke to me through it in a way that he had never had done before. Um, and that really changed my life. I read that day and night, wept for my sins, uh, wanted a different life for about a month. And then I kind of crashed. You know, there's, there's always like a fervor. And then sometimes... Uh, just, uh, I guess our enemy gets to us with discouragement and things like that. But that really, uh, I never lost the goal, I think, at that point. And I kept trying to come back to like, God, let me know you more. Who are you? Um, and what do you want for my life? And so that got me discerning. And um, somewhere actually in grad school, when I lived in like a Newman parish, like a, a parish that was attached to the university, basically, um, I began to just do all kinds of ministry and really kind of noticing how my life resembled that priest who was there living there. And um, I, I loved it. I fell in love with that kind of life that sort of really fell in love with the church and, and kind of giving my life in ministry and, and service to others. And uh, yeah, I never looked back. I think I started looking around for where to go. You know, I Thought about religious life and das and priesthood and really felt the call to come back home to Houston at that point and serve uh, here. Well, I, first of all, A, I love the fact that your story centers around um, not only Good Friday, but with St. Faustina, that, that our saints that are, are so critical to leading us to holiness through their example. And I hope that that gives some words of wisdom to a lot of people listening that they should always be looking for those saints in their lives that who can inspire them. Very true. Like I, I really think she, in some personal way, I feel like she kind of reached in and, and grabbed me out of the like mire of sin that I was kind of stuck in. So. And wouldn't she love that? Because she has such a heart as you could, when you read the diary, she has a, such a heart for priests. Mm -hmm. So she would love that she inspired you in that way to to go deeper, deeper and deeper and deeper until you actually said yes to this vocation, which I think is yeah. tremendous. Yeah, no, when I get to heaven, I'm going to thank St. Faustina. I hope yes. so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a great goal. <laughs> I love that. Um, and so then, so you said you were figuring out, you, you, you decided to come home. 
you said, okay, like coming back to the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, I'm going to do that. So then you reach out to the vocation director at this point. Yeah. I mean, it was a complicated process. Um, but I remember I first thought about coming to Houston, maybe because somebody even suggested, like I went on this retreat in the area where I was, I was near Toledo, Ohio. Okay. And so I went to their discernment retreat because the priest invited me to the local priest. And uh, I remember sitting across from the bishop and he was just kind of telling us, well, if you really think you're called to be a priest, you basically need to discern that. So don't make a decision yet, but make a decision to go to seminary where you can actually really think about and pray about, does God want me to be a priest? And when he said that, I mean, it wasn't that I was totally convinced by his reasoning. It was good reasoning, but I just knew inside, yeah, I need to. Like I've sat on this for so long, like at that point, you know, four years or so that I, I want it and I need to try this. And so I knew it was kind of spoken to me. And uh, I think I reached out to Father Clint at the time and I sent him this email. And, you know, now I realize uh, vocation directors do get some inquiries from out of towners, even people outside of the country. And it's hard to know exactly who these people are and what they're looking for and things. And so usually we do send them a questionnaire and say, like, tell us a little more about yourself and your situation. And, you know, if, if you're out of the country, we just want to let you know we can't get visas and things like that. Do you have one? and Stuff like that. So um, I remember like sending him this questionnaire and I don't think I heard back from him. And so I sent another email because I was like, what do I have to do to get this guy to take me seriously? Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not crazy. I could have answered some of these questions. Am I a male? Yes. Uh, <laughs> am I under 50? Yes. So, um, but after a while, he, he got back to me. He actually, it was great. Father Clint set up a time of discernment. He invited me to stay with him in his parish, uh, which was St. Rose. He must have been transitioning into a parish at that time. And then Father Dat was slowly taking over. Um, and I remember being in the parish and really kind of feeling some peace. It wasn't like an overwhelming sense of this is it, but it was like, this is all I need to let me know. This is safe. This is going to be okay. And I'm going for it. And so uh, that was, and I think at that point he met me. And so it became more serious. Like I understand who you are and what's motivating you. And, and yeah, I think this is right. Well, so I, I think a lot of that speaks to probably the discerners who would be listening to this. And, and any of us, honestly, when we're wrestling with a decision, mm -hmm. right? When we, we are coming to the place where we go, we feel like this is what's supposed to happen. Okay, come on now. Answer my email. Let's go. <laughs> we feel like, okay, it's time. It's time. And isn't that, isn't that the way it is, though, that God had, you know, in his infinite wisdom, right? And his timing and his plan, like he has it. It looks a little differently and for good reason. Yeah, God uh, is extremely patient. <laughs> I am not, right? That's the problem. Uh, and so it was a little difficult to like latch onto God's timeline. Um, but you're right, like he, he knows exactly the right time. I, you know, I said it took me like five years to really discern my vocation. And I think that was too long. But for me, I just know if I had entered any earlier, I would not have been ready. Um, I wouldn't have been ready for the kind of changes that had to happen in my heart and in my life. I mean, I was uh, living a pretty Catholic focused life, but I was pretty independent. I don't know that I would have tolerated well, like somebody telling me like, hey, we want you to pray in a different way and just give up the way you're praying right now. That's a lot of struggle for a young man who's like attached to his prayer life. So uh, it was really good that I entered when I did. So then tell me what was seminary life like for you in big picture? Like, you know, was this an overall good experience and what was good about it or what was challenging? It was, it was a beautiful experience. Like I knew six months in, this is exactly where I need to be, but it was also, it was pretty challenging. Um, so I, you know, you don't always get along with your peers. And I guess I, I came in kind of idealistic in a good way. I think every young person, if you're idealistic, hold on to a lot of that because it will serve you well throughout life. It'll drive you to, to a vision that, of the way things really should be. Um, but I also think that, um, yeah, I, I probably had a vision of seminary that it was going to be like this perfect society and all the men were, were going to be saints. I was going to be a saint too. Um, 
at the end of the day, I think some of that vision was driven by my own pride that like, hey, I'm pretty holy. We've got this holy group of friends I get along with so well, like this seminary is going to be like this on steroids. Um, and I think one, I didn't reckon with my own faults. And uh, that only happened in seminary, which was good for me. Like, I don't think my friends or anybody would have really pointed out the areas where I needed to grow. Um, like, like it happened in seminary where like, basically trained professionals coach you through like, this is where you need to grow. Like, um, I remember I had a formator once who I was upset at because he wouldn't let me go to a friend's funeral, which is like, okay, that's learning obedience. Like, um, he said, no, you have this other obligation. I don't want to go either, but we have to go. You can't go to this funeral. Um, it wasn't like a family member's funeral. So he said, no. Uh, and I remember telling him later, like, hey, I am angry at your decision. And he said, Richard, you're smiling. And I realized like, oh, my face is not registering. <laughs> so just little things like that, like no one's ever gonna tell you that your affect doesn't match your emotions except in seminary. So just, uh, I was really grateful for his comments. He made other great insights along the way, just to let me know, kind of like a mirror, like what he's seeing and what is good and what needs to be changed. Um, so just in general, I, I love seminary because it, it did put me in contact with other like like minded men who were really driven by the same things that I was uh, trying to live this holy life, be a great priest. And it also put me in a community where I was challenged uh, to either love the other person when I didn't really feel like it or uh, maybe to, you know, like change my own behavior and mannerisms so that I could be a better better brother like i i used to do annoying things and no one ever told me until i got to seminary which i'm, I'm grateful for so wow yeah those those are definitely some challenging areas to to get with it's very family-like mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like nobody's going to tell you you got the something the green something in your teeth you know but like your your family is kind of like Rhonda, you got you got the you know, so it's, it's, and they'll tell you lots more too. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you, know, so, you know, so that's, but that's what we need to grow. I mean, okay. Besides the teeth issue, but there's a lot of other things that, that iron sharper, sharpens iron. And, and that's what's needed in seminary because to get to the other end, I said, you know, we need um, our men so well formed on the other side of this to be a doctor of my soul. I mean, if you think about how nobody blinks an eye at the fact that a medical doctor goes to school for decades, it seems, right? But then they go, they have to go to seminary for eight years? What? You know, I'm like, yeah, hello. Are, they're in charge of my spiritual life. I want them to know what they're doing. I want to be able to trust them. And I want them, you to be able to trust yourself. There's so much to learn. And there's so much you don't even get education for in That's seminary. Right. We, we often think this could be longer. Like oh, yeah. There are things that I wish they would have told me, but but they can't because they just can't pack it into seven years. You're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Well, and there's no way in, um, for example, for me as a married woman, like there was no, no way that a pre-Cana, you know, a marriage prep was going to prepare me for everything that I was going to encounter in marriage. All, all the married people can say amen right now because I know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, you know, there is just no way. And same with the priests, same with sisters. There's some of just life has to happen. Yeah, yeah. But we we try to pack in as much as we can because we. you're right, Rhonda. Like, you really want a priest to come out, a spiritual father. And that that is something that I think uh, if you talk to newly ordained priests, they realize right away that it's not like they just got married. It's like they got married and had 20,000 kids. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a really instant fatherhood that's conferred on priests uh, where people are depending on them to lead them in the spiritual life, to you know, wake up for mass on time and, and preach a great homily or uh, really guide them through the mass uh, to have that kind of relationship with the Trinity that they can then share and communicate with others. Uh, so all these things, they just take a long time because human beings don't change overnight. They, they change slowly. And so I'm grateful it was seven years because it was spread out and the changes I needed to make and the growth that needed to happen, it did happen. 
uh, in, in a very great way, but uh, not all at once, which is I'm grateful for. So. so then you are in a parish for a while, right, as as a proco vicar, and you get like this little tap on the shoulder, you know, to go, um, Father Richard, we, we want you to be the vocation director. Like that was not expected, right? Was that, were you, were you, did you have that on your radar that somebody was going to be tapping you on the shoulder? I was the last person I thought would be the vocation director. I had nominated in my head. I had even told other people like Father Dad Wong, uh, the former vocation director, hey, this is your successor right here. And I meant it seriously, like Father Preston Cantella, who would have thought like the way he promotes priesthood, that's a vocation director. Um, I would not have seen myself in this role were it not that when I went on this retreat and I felt like in the silence of the retreat, God was asking me to do something different, even though I thought I was going to be at the parish for another year because the pastor was transitioning out. Uh, and sure enough, when I get off the silent retreat, I check my voicemail and right away I see that I have a call from the cardinal and I'm thinking there's only two things he could call me about because everything else is handled by other people. So I'm leaving my parish. Like it was just a very clear thing. And even then I could not accept it was probably going to be because I was going to be a vocation director. I thought it was the other option, like surely not Lord, but no. Um, in fact, it was funny. Somebody on that retreat uh, who was with, I don't know if you know, Sister Breege McKenna, she prays for priests, um, but they uh, said this little prayer with me and they had this like prophetic vision. They said, I see you leading young men into the church to like worship the Eucharist or to be with the Eucharist. And I thought this meant like I was going to have this like adoration time and but no, like this is so clearly like, hey, that's what I do. I lead young men to like offer the Eucharist. I am that like uh, gate uh, keeper and, and like journeyman who takes the guy who is interested from priesthood day one to like all the way to see them get ordained. I do. And it's in what, how beautiful is that? And I think you are a, the perfect person for this in Seeds of Galveston, Houston, because you basically have, now that I know, and I've been working with you have, and I've worked with previous vocation directors here, it re, it kind of re-envisioned the office of vocations to the office of vocational discernment. Like yeah. that, that is the key to all of this, that that's your role. It does. You said as a journeyman, it's not to recruit, mm -hmm. right? You're not just a, a vocation promoter. Like you're trying to help everybody discern what God's calling them to. Yeah, I think we would love, and that's our vision, to see that everybody in the archdiocese, the young people, find their vocation. Because we know that when that happens, right, like when people live out what God has called them to do, and they love it, and God will give a sort of grace, right, and everything will work. Everything will be beautiful. Uh, people will be happy. It'll, it'll be success in a, in a very spiritual way. Uh, so one, I mean, I asked, yeah, to, to put a verb in our office name because I thought like, hey, all these other offices that work with people, they have like catechesis or they have other verbs or, you know, like words that imply actions and uh, ours doesn't. And so the activity that I think we do the best, the most here in the office is really help people find God's voice and plan for their life. And that's that's all that we're really trying to do. Most of our retreats are aimed at that now just helping people find God's voice and his will for their life. Amen. And I, I just think that you're on the forefront here, Father. So I, I want to affirm you in that, that though you may not have, when when that tap on the shoulder came, um, may not have understood or really, is it me? It probably should be him. That I see in so many ways exactly you're the person to, to do this huge monumental task over the first few years of being in office of really changing it up in such a way. So I, I, would, I would encourage everybody listening to pray for their vocation director in their diocese. Um, we talk a lot about praying for their priests uh, that's in front of you every weekend, but um, I would charge all of you to add your vocation director to this this uh, list of who you're praying for on a regular basis because they need it. They they need your prayers on a regular basis. Thank you for that, Rhonda. We we certainly do appreciate those prayers. I think a lot of times people kind of forget about the vocation director because we we don't really stay in one place for too long. We kind of migrate around the diocese and, and things like that. 
but uh, it's, you know, it's also, I want to say, uh, it's not that Father Preston doesn't do vocational work. I think that was the misunderstanding I also had was that only one person does this job. No, 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 no. I might be an organizing force, but all the priests in the archdiocese are part of this vocational ministry. They really have a place to call young people forth, especially young men who are thinking about priesthood. And quite frankly, everybody, and this is your work, Rhonda, right? Like everybody in the archdiocese, everybody in, in the church has a role to play in vocational ministry to call yes. and to help young people, to guide them, or at least to it, like enable the encounters, you know, uh, of vocations in, in the church. And that is absolutely true. Um, everybody ha is supposed to be a vocation promoter and praying for vocations. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us, Father Richard. It, of course, it went so fast, but I'm so thankful that you took the time to speak with us today uh, about not only your testimony, but about uh, discernment and vocations and all of those things. So thank you. Can you please give us your priestly blessing? Absolutely. Thank you, Rhonda. And thanks to all the listeners for their prayers and support. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you.